our showcase. Right. Can't think of a better follow up to that than Roya Candelon, who I introduced before. Roya, thank you so much for taking the time. Please take the stage. Thank you so much for the introduction and for this opportunity. Perfect. Um, so as um, it was mentioned, my name is Roya, and it means a very sweet dream in Farsi. I got my PhDs in electrical engineering under the supervision of Professor Kamishna Maduri, and he's a well-known scientist for his work on uh, UAVs. Currently, I'm working as a senior research scientist with a focus on generative AI. Uh, in addition, I'm also a Google developer expert and cloud champion in AI, ML, and Gen AI. I'm a WTM. It's a program by Google also that um, tries to empower women and non-binary people to be uh, essentially to grow in their career and education. And lastly, I'm a community organizer as a part of GDG Cloud Boston. And I kindly invite you to join us next week at our IO Extended. With that being said, uh, let's dive in. I like to always start from the beginning and talk about what is generative AI. But to actually uh, appreciate generative AI, we need to talk about what was before that. So recently, before generative AI, we were talking about predictive AI. But the beauty of predictive AI was only because prior to that, we had to do feature engineer and we had to build kernels and feature maps to actually enable us to identify an entity in an image, for example. Later, um, when, for example, Sony got um, uh, the technology to identify faces and a smile, uh, that was a huge breakthrough. In 2012, when we got to the age of AI and we were able to use convolutional neural network to automize this kernel uh, essentially adjustment, it was a very huge breakthrough because now we were able to identify cats and dogs, which was a huge problem, huge research problem prior that to that point. Right now with generative AI, we are in a point that we have these gigantic significant models and we have a huge amount of data set that enables this model to not only just figure out what is the kernel to identify an object, but what are those features that makes an entity a being to exist and we are able to read between these lines and extrapolate and interpolate to actually generate new content that was not existing before. An interesting type of generative AI is large language models. We call them large because they are significantly uh, big so they have a lot of parameters and they also get exposed to a lot of data. Essentially, they are fancy autocomplete. So what they do is they determine after each word what is the most probable next word that can happen. So if you have this sentence, it's raining cats, and the model has the confidence of 90% that the next word should be dogs, rain with 3%, drops with 2%. And based on uh, your essentially... Uh, features, you can decide which one you want to choose, what is the threshold, how much creativity you wanted to give to the model. But uh, let's say we go with the highest probability, then the model would be fed in with its raining cats and dogs and decide to uh, determine what is the next word. I want to point out that before the time of uh, large language models, a lot of what we utilize large language model for today was available to us through natural language processing. Something like sentiment analysis, translation, or classification were already uh, available to us. So for example, we had a review and Twitter uh, classification to identify whether it's a positive or negative review, or whether this tweet is an harassment or not. What large language model provide to us is in three folds. Uh, the ability to do chat, the ability to generate new content, and the ability to do sentiment search uh, in comparison to having keyword search, which was just based on one word. On top of that, when we are dealing with large language model, now we can go with uh, different modalities. So 
these figures showcase how we can turn one modality, let's say images or videos, to a numeric representation and then enable this numeric representation, which each of them coming from a different modality, to sit into next place in, to a vicinity in a latent space. So the same way that when you think about, let's say, the word Paris, you can think about the, the location of the location of Paris an image of what Paris would look like, how you say it, how you write it, all of them come together in the same vicinity in your brain. Uh, we are trying to do that in the same latent as in the latent space with large language model and multimodality models. Uh, an interesting literature that I think um, must be one of the first one was a work by Andre Carpati that took uh, the numeric value utilizing recurrent neural network from takes a numeric value uh, getting from convolutional neural network from images to put them together in a latent space to enable image captioning. And these figures are showcasing Gemini, Ultra Pro, and Nano, which each of them uh, basically based on the size uh, provide different type of quality. On top of that, Gemini enables us to have a larger context window. Prior, uh, previously, they were this context window of 1 million tokens. But uh, to this year at I.O., they mentioned or they released uh, 2 million tokens, which essentially means we can uh, upload up to 2 hours worth of video, 22 hours worth of audio, 60,000 lines of code, or 1.4 million words into these models. And to give you an estimate, uh, all of the Harry Potter series are less than 1.1 million in words. What you are providing these models is a gigantic amount of information when they are trying to make decisions. So you are trying to make the best use case to make sure that they have the information that you want. But is that enough? And before I answer that question, I wanted, I cannot do this talk and not to mention this paper. This is the reason that we have this very large context window. Prior to that, to have a, a larger, um, a, essentially a larger context, we require to have bigger memory and bigger um, essentially compute. And still we do need them. But this paper, attention is all you need, that was released by Google in 2017 enabled us to have a mathematic representation for how we pay attention to certain words and the context when we talk as human. And this mathematic representation enabled us to be able to condense this gigantic uh, context window to something that is manageable with uh, today's compute and memory. I strongly recommend reading this paper. Okay, now let me answer that question. Is it enough to just have a very large context window? Does it answer all of the problem that we have? We require to have model tuning. If you were in the field of AI previous to this era of generative AI, fine tuning was already a practice. When you had a model that was working on a certain area very well, but you wanted to adjust it to work in a specific area even better. One of the, um, I think, uh, common practices was to utilize, a, for example, image uh, recognition or classifier that was already trained on ImageNet data set and utilize it to uh, and find you need for a certain type of a smaller group of uh, categories. Now we are taking the same idea, but in large language model. We are still going to train a model with uh, uh, some new examples to guide the model to specifically do one thing. It would enable the model to have higher quality for that one specific task. It increases the, mode, mo, uh, the model robustness and it lowers the inference time. I want you to think about fine tuning a model as if uh, you go to an specialist. Suppose if something, God forbid, happens to you and you go to your primary care, they have an idea of what can go wrong, but they are not that their specialty is not that problem. Uh, God forbid, if it's cancer or if it's a heart problem, they would refer you to go to a cardiologist or oncologist. Fine tuning models is exactly that. We are removing um, 
some of the extra information somewhat and we are providing this model with new information to be a specific and specialized in one simple task and we want them to be really really good in that task example of that right now are um, med palm and med seg which is uh Generative AR for medical purposes and generative AR for security purposes, both are released by Google. The, there is a spectrum for how much fine tuning we wanted to apply to a model. One side of this spectrum would be fine tuning the whole part, all of the available parameters. And if you recall, when I started this session, I mentioned that we are talking about significant amount of parameters. So we are talking about billions and billions of parameters. The other side of this spectrum is just to provide the model with a few examples and not to touch any of the weights. So in that scenario, we are utilizing the context, uh, the context window available to us, and we just and, uh, give model a few examples example of what we wanted to do. Obviously, if you stay closer to full fine tuning, we are able to solve more challenging problems, but similar to anything, uh, higher quality comes with higher cost and requires more effort. So we need to have a bigger data set and we are actually sacrificing a speed to get to that point. On the other hand, if we stay with few shot learning and just give examples, we are not changing anything in the model. So we do not require any type of um, essential compute or uh, it will be really fast, but the quality is not as much. Somewhere in the middle should be our um, essentially sweet spot. There are multi, uh, a variety of methods to stay in there. You can just um, choose a subset of the model to train, or you can use uh, methods like LoRa uh, that enables us to choose a subset that would uh, have the highest impact. With that being said, uh, let's dive into this uh, demo. And I hope that I was not talking too fast because I wanted to get here. Uh, for the first demo, I wanted to utilize AI Studio. AI Studio is a web interface provided to users uh, to utilize J uh, Gemini APIs. It's really good for rapid prototyping. And as far as I know, and don't quote me on that, but as far as I know, it's free uh, when you are staying in that sandbox. It's similarly, uh, it's it just like a sandbox that there is no code required. You can put everything in natural language and see if your idea is actually doable. If you look into aistudio.google.com, you will see an interface like what you see on this slide. On the top left, uh, there is get API key that enables you to get an API key that you can use um, inside the AI studio or outside. But be aware that if you utilize it outside of this uh, platform, you will be charged based on the number of tokens and as such. In the middle, you have essentially similar to what you have with ChatGPT or Gemini web page and an interface that allows you to talk or put a prompt for any of the models that you are interested in. Uh, in the right, you have all of the models available to you. So right now, uh, let's say we have Gemini 1.5 Pro. Below that, we have the uh, number of tokens that you are utilizing in each prompt. And be aware that you are getting charged, not in this interface, but in general, you are getting charged for both the tokens that you are utilizing when you prompt and also all of the tokens that would be utilized to generate the output. Below that, we have the temperature. Essentially, this is how much creativity you allow your model to have. When you put it at one, your model would be deterministic. When you go lower than one, uh, you essentially give your model a little bit of bigger room to go crazy. If you recall at the beginning, I had this uh, sentence, it's raining cats and, and I showcased that on the top, dogs has 90%, rain has 2%, so on and so forth. When you are lowering the temperature, you are allowing your model to choose from words that have less confidence. Below that, you have add stop sequence. That would be a sequence that you 
force your model to stop there, no matter what is the confidence of the word after that. Usually these models stop when the confidence uh, uh, fell under a certain value. But uh, with a stop sequence, even if the next word has highest confidence, you stop there. And lastly, you have some safety settings uh, that would give you room to, for example, modify how many tokens you want to allocate to your output and what, uh, what are some uh, responsible AI knobs that you wanted to tune, for example, to make sure that the system is not um, braces, it's not uh, doing anything, any harassment, it's not uh, vengeful, all of those things. And finally, on the top, um, as I mentioned, these models are no code. So everything that you put here would be in plain English. But as a developer, you might want to actually realize this outside of this platform and sandbox. So you will click on uh, get code and it provides you with the code in Python or a variety of different languages based on your choice. Uh, to fine tuning model, um, you will open this uh, platform and then choose new tuned model. And then um, you are providing the model with some information. The model would be trained and you will get some sort of loss function per epoch to showcase how much your model have been uh, tuned. Let me show you in, uh, in, in real time how I actually do that. So I have the AI studio in here. And as, we men um, as I mentioned, so we have the get API key, we have this um, essentially prompting um, area and then all of those features on the side. And then all of your advanced setting that you can put here for safety and uh, for responsible AI. For fine tuning, I will choose new tuned model and it provides me with an uh, with a platform to do both of the, uh, both side of those uh, spectrum. So I can do a structured prompting, which is actually few shot prompting, or I can import a data set to utilize here for fine tuning my model. Um, if you had time and read on the top of the your data set should be either in Google Sheet or in CSV format. I will import uh, a data set from my sheet. Uh, I already generated this uh, data for this course. Uh, the data is based on a dummy uh, application that I was thinking about for generating the content or the micros of each food um, and put categorizing them based on carbohydrate, protein, and fat. So when you are inputting a name of the food, you call it an input column, it would generate it. Uh, carbohydrate, protein, and fat content or ingredients in that model. Uh, you require to have um, at least 16 to 20 examples. I put 25 in here. After you load your data, you choose a name for your model, you choose the base model that you wanna utilize, and then you press tune. Because we don't have enough of time, I already have done it. And this is the output of my system. So this is uh, my model, uh, how long it took, how many examples I had, and some of the features. And this is uh, basically the loss function. Now we can go to the create prompting and actually utilize this model and, and see if uh, it works or not. Um, I want to do something risky, and I want to first uh, try it here. So. This is a model that I have not tuned. So let's see if I put food pizza, what would the uh, what would be the output? It gives me an explanation of the type of, uh, some explanation about pizza. Pizza is a great start to give you a more helpful res uh, response. Tell me what you want to know about pizza, for example, blah, blah, blah. Now let me show you what the model that I fine tuned does. If you recall, my model would call uh, food fine tune LR 0 0.8. So I reset uh, this and now it does. Okay, clear chat. I reset and I clear chat. I have my model. I will type the same thing. So food quotation pizza. And when I run it, it follows the same practice that I expected. So it gives me three different categories of uh, 
essentially carbohydrates, protein, fat, and all of the ingredients that we utilize in a pizza, um, essentially um, for each of those categories. Uh, if I press get code, I can get the code in Python, Java, Android, and Kotlin to actually do the same thing and enable me to utilize this model outside of this sandbox of, uh, let's say, AI Studio. Okay. Oh, uh, now let's go back in here. Oh, uh, if you don't like a sandbox, you might want to actually do it in reality and with more number of example and with a fancier um, type of setting, you can actually utilize uh, Vertex AI to do the same thing. If you open Vertex AI, you will see that on the side you have languages. Under languages, you can go and choose tune and distill and then create a new distill, uh, create a new tune model and it provides you with some um, essentially settings to enable you to do the same thing. So you choose the name of the your model, you can choose your base model, the region based on like you will be charged essentially for tuning, and then how many epochs you want. Uh, a learning rate multiplier, which is a percentage of what was the real learning rate that was utilized to um, train the model, and also an adapter size, which is a value um, saying where in that spectrum you want to stay. So uh, the bigger it is, the larger number of um, essentially uh, parameters you are fine tuning. And then uh, to, to input the data here, now it is not CSV or uh, Google Sheet. You actually have to have a JSON L file, which is located in your uh, Google uh, storage bucket. Or if it's not, you will look uh, upload it to your Google storage bucket. And a JSON L file has to have a specific format. So it has to have an, a structure that has a message and then three rows. It has a system role that can be optional. And that's basically you giving a role to your system and saying, hey, you are a pirate or you are a lawyer or you are an engineer. And then, for example, uh, you want to have a pairing of uh, when the role is user and there is a content associated with it. And then when the role is the model and a content associated with it. And that content is what you expect your model to generate. So. I have, an, I have an example here, which is a generic example. So I have the system, it, there, uh, it has a role. Um, and then I have the user and model diversify your investment portfolio, and then the output should be business. Let's go back to our demo and see how we do it in AI Studio and in Vertex AI. Before doing that, let me show you uh, what the data looks like. I gen to generate this data, I utilize another LLM to build 100 different type of food. And then I use another LLM to tell me what are the um, carbohydrate, fat, uh, fat, and protein content of those and put each of them in a CSV file. And then I read it into Python and, and, and generated um, each of these rows that calls message. And then there is a a list goes with role user. So this is my input. This is the input that I expect the user to give. And the content is the name of the food. And it has to have the same structure when we are doing, uh, when we are inputting the fine tune model. And the output is role model. And then the content, the output that the model would uh, generate for me is carbohydrate, blah, 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 protein, and fat and then it put a quotation and puts everything in here, right? So now we go to Vertex AI. I go to languages. I go to tune and distill, create a new tune model, and then I do a supervised tuning. I give it a name, let's say GAI fine tune. And then I have my advanced setting that I can choose and modify. Uh, when I continue, I wanted to upload file to the cloud storage. 
I will uh, look into this file. I have it here. I choose a cloud bucket that I want it to be located there. And then I can say a start tuning. Let's say we did it, but obviously it takes some time. So I already have done one for this session before. And if you click on that, uh, you will see uh, essentially the same type of loss function and also some more information. For example, you can enable it to have validation metrics in here. But if we wanted to follow what we did with AI Studio, we can just test the model. And now we are in the same uh, scenario. So we have food fine tuning, which is the name of model. And we can put the, uh, what, what we think in here, food, pizza. Let's see what it outputs. Carbohydrate, dough, tomato sauce, protein, cheese, and pepperoni, and fat, cheese, and olive oil. As you see, it ex um, exactly followed the same um, type of input, uh, the same type of structure that we provided to the model when we were uh, generating the data. Obviously, when you have a more complex task, you wanted to have more um, the more number of uh, essentially examples. And this is an interesting way to build agents because now each of these model can exactly do one certain things and they can be specialized in something. Um, with that being said, let me go back and I have- a... Roya, just, oh. just before you go on, I just wanted to stop here. Does yes. anyone have any um, questions for Roya at this point before we go to the agent part? Because I know we're getting to about 18 minutes left. Uh, Roya, uh, your your models that you've uh, been working on so far in these demos, if you ask those, uh, for example, using the chat interface, what is the capital of a city or another arcane fact, um, it probably won't know the answers, correct? Yes. I think they know something. I never try. Let's ask it. What is the capital of France? It is the that. So, so it's... So it's Picking up some other things beyond what you've put in. We are not able to um, manipulate all of the weights, right? And you are still uh, holding on some of those information. But I would not suggest to ask some more complex things that you expect a generic model to do from a model that you fine tune. The more parameter you fine tune, you are taking away more of the generic ab ab ability. Yes, okay. and R RJ is also making a clarification here. RJ, I don't know if you want to just speak to what you put in the chat or just leave it in the chat. Okay, so um, regarding the temperature comment, uh, I think that you sort of flipped it by mistake, not intentionally, but um, zero is always the most deterministic and either one or two, depending on which model, is going to be the most higher temperature, the most non-deterministic. So basically, um, if it's one or two, depending on the model, it'll pick it. You're giving the model freedom to pick a, a less likely probable of choice and therefore the results will be more creative. Whereas if it's zero, it's it's always going to pick the most the most uh, likely uh, choice statistically, the, the, and then therefore give the the best answer, uh, not and not a creative answer. So just wanted to point that out, and that can be confusing for a lot uh, for people on the call, just so they know, because. Um, what they're doing in, in, in Gemini, in AI Studio, is allowing different ranges for different um, models. And also, ChatGPT, OpenAI, did sort of a similar thing, where initially they had the, the range from 0 to 1, and then later on they changed it from 0 to 2. So it, it gets confusing for everybody. So I just wanted to point all that out. Sorry for all that detail. Sure. Absolutely. As, as, Thank you very as, much. Yeah, as Adam points out, it's it's pretty standard that that higher temperature equals more 
creativity or randomness across the models. Hey, um, the Roya, um, I know we're, uh, we've got a little under 15 minutes here. Uh, were you going to also cover a little bit about agents? Then we want to have a little time for open mic. Uh, I just have two more slides, um, not actually on agents. Uh, I wanted to really keep it on fine tuning. That's I fine. have one slide, um, two more slides. I think I, it worth it. Um, so one of the questions that comes a lot is when rag, when fine tuning? Uh, I thought to have a slide in here that's mentioned that when we are doing fine tuning, we are actually spending a lot of more money ahead of time with the hope that it would re uh, reduce the amount of money that we are going to require along uh, while we are utilizing because then the amount of information that we are inputting to the model would be low. So the size of token would be smaller. Whereas when you are utilizing RAG, you would... Uh, your initial cost would be just generating that index uh, vector database. And every time that you are prompting the model, you are pulling all of this information from your database and you are putting it in, into, into your model and then you ask it to generate a new, essentially, uh, piece of information. It should be noted that it's not one versus the other. In a lot of example, particular and mainly when you know your data would be changing a lot, uh, an and situation would be uh, the most, I think, uh, desirable. desirable. Uh, lastly, I mentioned a lot of data, uh, a lot of different uh, Gemini uh, models available to us. So we have Gemini Pro, we have Nano, Flash, and Gamma. Uh, to a start, what is the best strategy, in my uh, humble opinion, to choose one of these models? It based on what matters to you the most. Uh, I think it would fall under these four categories of quality, speed, cost, and control. If quality matters to you after the stage of prototyping that you know what you want to do is doable with Gemini, usually starting with Gemini Pro, you can invest more to make that Gemini Pro fine-tune. If you want the speed and you want to do an on edge device, then Gemini Nano would be a better solution. But if a speed and cost would matter to you the most, Gemini Flash is the best to go because it's the cheapest one. And lastly, if you want to have the full control over your system, you can go with uh, Gemini or with Gamma, which is fully, um, it's essentially an open source model. With that being said, I'm really grateful for this time. And if you wanted to connect with me, please uh, scan the QR code. And thank you again. Thank you very much, Roy, Roya, and appreciate that. Any other questions for Roya right now? Uh, off the top of your head, how much did the demo cost to show us today? Was that was that a ten cent demo, a three dollar demo, or a four hundred dollar demo? It's less than one dollar. All right, Roya, thank you so much.